<laughs> Here's to Meg. And that's drawn right by us. So everybody has um, gotten themselves their refreshments, I assume, and we're ready to get started. So good afternoon and welcome to today's faculty and staff development on culturally responsive teaching with Dr. Francisco Rios and Dr. Kristen French from Western Washington University. My name is Regina Brocker, and as Dean in the College of Arts and Sciences, I would like to affirm the importance of culturally responsive teaching for all of us, whether we are students, staff, faculty, or interested members of the community. As our world changes around us and we engage that change, it is increasingly important that we all commit to being active participants in the teaching and learning spiral that daily informs our interactions. We know that these extend beyond our learning environments, whether in schools, on campus, online, or in our on-site locations, but also with and across our communities in our outreach efforts and in our personal interactions face-to-face -face and in social media. Thank you for your commitment and your interest today. I look forward to joining with you in today's sessions, and I wish you well. Good afternoon, colleagues, and here and online. We do have some folks on live stream. My name is Tanya Lubis, and I am a faculty member in the College of Education and also the director of the Center for Culturally Responsive Practices. And it's with a great deal of pleasure today I introduce you all to my friend, Dr. Kristen French. Um, Dr. Rios and Dr. French uh, will both be co-presenting this evening, but today Dr. French is giving the presentation. Uh, she is an associate professor in elementary education and director of the Center for Education, Equity, and Diversity at Western Washington University. She graduated from Western with a bachelor degree in anthropology, a minor in Native American studies, and elementary education. She completed a master's at University of Massachusetts Amherst in bilingual ESL and multicultural education, and a PhD in language literacy and culture at the University of Massachusetts as well. She taught in an urban magnet Montessori school in Massachusetts and returned to Western Washington University after a 21-year absence to join the College of Education. Her engaged scholarship includes multicultural teacher education, indigenous education, decolonizing theory, and critical performative pedagogy. She is well known for exceptional work in language literacy and culture, specifically in indigenous education. At Western Washington, she focuses on putting the theory of social justice into practice by offering rich opportunities for students to engage in the community work and focus on the issues of equity. She has received numerous awards and recognition for her work, including an excellent Excellence in Teaching Award, and she also has multiple publications and presentations. And most recently, it's part of a higher education and K-12 school partnership pilot project with University of Washington that was awarded $400,000 to provide professional development. It's a true honor to have her here today to share with you some of her experiences um, and the work of approaching um, how to foster inclusive learning environments for our culturally and linguistically diverse students. So please join me in welcoming her. Is that me? Oh my goodness, that sounded great. I'm gonna rest on those laurels um, for the rest of the presentation. 
so thank you so much for having both of us here today. It's an honor to be back. How many of you were here last year for our present? Oh, good. So this is part two for real. Great. So when we talked with the team, um, we got such great feedback. And, and um, Tanya and Kristen said, please come back with more of what you did. And, and so we're really reflecting in that. So I'm going to um, spend some time with you thinking about an approach to fostering inclusive environments for culturally and linguistically diverse learners through a lens of what's happened in the year since we saw you last. Because a lot has happened sociopolitically, historically, and personally in our own community context. So for me, it's really gonna be a year-long journey of relationships, restoration, responsibility, renewal, and reciprocity, and looking that from the lens of how do we cultivate critical hope in a new, it's crossed out for a reason, it's not a typo, um, <laughs> multicultural education. I'll explain the title shortly. So one year later, here we are, and I had to ask Kristen and Tanya, am I wearing the same outfit that I wore last year? We'll find <laughs> out if the video is the same. No, great, <laughs> thank you. Um, so one year later, we come back to you um, with an allegiance to gratitude. Um, so thank you, Tanya, and the EOU team for inviting us and, and being so gracious. Francisco and I were just blown away by um, the lovingness, the, the way that we were brought into the community and the interactions with folks. So thank you all so much for inviting us back again and, and again hosting us in such a beautiful way. So thank you, Tanya and the team. Uh, we also want to share our gratitude to the Confederated Tribes of Umatilla Indians as we are on their ceded lands, um, as well as the Cayuse and Walla Walla, whose ancestral homeland we occupy, and the Nez Perce, who historically utilize this land. So um, my hands up are to all of you. And then <clears throat> I need to give a, a shout out to my sisters. Um, Dr. Annalise and Dr. Vero Velas, um, whose collective and collaborative work I'll be sharing today. So without them, this work is impossible. And I think one of my big takeaways today with all of you is, is where do we find our critical friends or our sisterhood or brotherhood or community-based um, ways of doing this work? So in this one-year reflection, I hope to honor the work that Francisco shared with you last year at this time. And I remember sitting in the back and, and watching Francisco and thinking, oh my gosh, this is just, you know, I, I, I know his work, I know him as a wonderful human being, and I get to have the privilege of being mentored by him. But sitting back and watching the presentation around multicultural education as a human right was such an honor. And, um, and so it's, it's really an honor today. So Francisco said, hey, I get to do the, the faculty uh, professional development. And so, you know, this is your launching point. And, and so I, I'm honored. And in order to honor Francisco, um, I want to kind of go back. Let's look at multicultural education as a human right. And then also thinking about multicultural education as a more than human right. Hmm. So, yes, and so I'm gonna ask you to be like a berry today, um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that too. So hopefully we'll be cultivating hope. Now pay attention to cultivation, being a berry, more than um, human rights. Um, we're going to be looking at multicultural education through relationships, restoration, responsibility, renewal, and reciprocity. So, we're beginning with the Honorable Harvest, um, an emerging framework for, for multicultural education. So you're going to hear me speak. How many of you are familiar with the book Braiding Sweetgrass? Okay, after today, you are going to be so familiar with this book. Um, I've fallen madly in love um, with Robin Wall Kimmerer. And this book was introduced to me uh, this, within this year. And it is indigenous wisdom, scientific knowledge, and the teachings of plants. Now, you have to understand that my background is in multicultural education. 
um, indigenous education, uh, but I am not a biologist or an ethnobotanist. And my work has been primarily with people. And what I've found, one of my big learnings throughout this year has been that we are, our relationships to folks um, that are more than people or more than human is essential in the work that we do as educators in multicultural education. So cultures of gratitude must also be cultures of reciprocity. So before I begin today, I'm going to be sharing with you the Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving Address. And I'm gonna ask for some help. You can all see this pretty, oh, look at that, it's huge. Okay, good. Um, so I'm gonna ask folks who are willing to participate with me. So the Haudenosaunee Address, which is shared in the chapter in Braiding Sweetgrass, which is called Allegiance to Gratitude, um, was shared because Robin, had her third grade daughter, um, she got a phone call from the third grade teacher saying, your daughter, who is very sweet and kind and loving, is causing some trouble in school. She's refusing to stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance, which she's done very respectfully, but she, the teacher shared with her that Although she was being respectful, other students were starting to follow her lead. And they stopped saying the Pledge of Allegiance. So of course, Robin, who's a faculty member and a teacher, um, you know, had this wonderful conversation um, with the classroom teacher, but also started wrestling with what would it look like if we asked ourselves and our children to pledge allegiance to gratitude rather than to pledge allegiance to a political ideology. And so she takes us on a journey to communicate with the Haudenosaunee folks um, and their Thanksgiving address. And, and she talks to um, faith keeper Orrin Lyons and he and asks permission, can I write about this? Can we talk about this Thanksgiving address? And he says, of course, it's supposed to be shared. Um, otherwise, how can it work? So this has been translated into 40 different languages and has been used and is, and is given freely for all of us to use. So what would it look like to be raised on gratitude, to speak to the natural world as a member of the democracy of species, to raise a pledge of interdependence? No declarations of political loyalty are required, just a response to the repeated question can we agree to be grateful for all that is given? So I'm gonna start there. And I'm gonna start there because, first of all, it's grounding for me too. In these challenging times, and challenging for multicultural education, challenging for our communities and our children, um, challenging for teachers, how do we embody gratitude? So, for those of you who are willing, this is gonna be like a call, you know, um, and response. And so when you see, now our minds are one, please feel free to, um, to share in response. And if you feel like you are willing to participate, you can take a stanza as well. So I'm gonna begin. The people, today, we are gathered, and we see that the cycles of life continue. We have been given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and all living things. So now, we bring our minds together as one, and we give greetings and thanks to each other as people. Now our minds are one. Now our minds are one. The waters. We give thanks to all the waters of the world for cleansing our souls and providing us with hope. Water is life. We know its power in many forms. Waterfalls and rains, mist and stream, rivers and oceans. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to this holy water. 
now our minds are one. Now our minds are one. Now our minds are one. The third plan. With one mind, we tend to honor and thank all the tree plants we harvest from the garden. Since the beginning of time, the grains, vegetables, beans, and berries have helped the people survive. Many other living things draw strength from them too. We gather all the plants grouped together as one and send them a greeting of praise. Now our minds are one. Now our minds are one. The animals. We gather our minds together to send greetings and thanks to all the animal life in the world. They have many things to teach us as people. We are honored by them when they give up their lives so we may use their bodies as food for our people. We see them near our homes and in the deep forests. We are glad they are still here, and we hope that it will always be so. Now our minds are one. The trees. We now turn our thoughts to the trees. The earth has many families of trees who have their own instructions and uses. Some provide us with shelter and shade, others with fruit, beauty, and other useful things. Many people of the world use a tree as a symbol of peace and strength. With one mind, we greet and thank the tree life. Now, now our, our minds, minds are, are one. one. The birds. We put our minds together as one and thank all the birds who move and fly about over our heads. The Creator gave them beautiful songs. Each day they remind us to enjoy and appreciate life. The eagle was chosen to be their leader. To all the birds, from the smallest to the largest, we send our joyful greetings and thanks. Now, now our, our minds are one. The four winds. We are all thankful to the powers we know as the four winds. We hear their voices in the moving air as they refresh us and purify the air we breathe. They help us to bring the change of seasons from the four directions they come, bringing us messages and giving us strength. With one mind, we send our greetings and thanks to the four winds. Now our minds are one. The Thunderers. Now we turn to the west where our grandfathers, the thunder beings, live. With lightning and thundering voices, they bring with them the water that renews life. We are thankful that they keep those evil things made by aquisirs underground. We bring our minds together as one to send greetings and thanks to our grandfathers, the thunderers. Now our minds are one. The sun. We now send greetings and thanks to our eldest brother, the sun. Each day without fail, he travels the sky from east to west, bringing the light of a new day. He is the source of all the fires of life. With one mind, we send greeting and thanks to our brother, the sun. Now our minds are one. The 
Grandmother Moon, we put our minds together to give thanks to our oldest grandmother, the moon, who lights the nighttime sky. She is the leader of women all over the world, and she governs the movement of the ocean tides. By her changing face, we measure time, and it is the moon who watches over the arrival of children here on Earth. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to our grandmother, the moon. Now our minds are one. The stars. We give thanks to the stars who are spread across the sky like jewelry. We see them in the night, helping the moon to light the darkness and bringing dew to the gardens and growing things. When we travel at night, they guide us home. With our minds gathered together as one, we send greetings and thanks to the stars. Now our, our minds, minds are, are one. one. The enlightened teachers. We gather our minds to greet and thank the enlightened teachers who have come to help us throughout the ages. When we forget how to live in harmony, they remind us of the way we were instructed to live as people. With one mind, we send greeting and thanks to these caring teachers. Now our minds are one. The Creator. Now we turn our thoughts to the Creator, our Great Spirit, and send greetings and thanks for all the gifts of creation. Everything we need to live a good life is here on this Mother Earth. For all the love that is still around us, we gather our minds together as one and send our choicest words of greetings and thanks to the Creator. Now our minds are one. Okay, I'll take the last one. Closing words. We have now arrived at the place where we end our words. Of all the things we named, it is not our intention to leave anything out. If something was forgotten, we leave it to each individual to send such greetings and thanks in their own way. Now our minds are one. All right. If you could just take a moment to just sit with our minds being one and being okay with the length of time that it took to share that and just be in the space for just a moment and check in with yourself. you for all of us coming together as our, um, with our minds as one as we continue with this. And I'll share with you that um, in the classes that I've been co-teaching with my colleague, Dr. Annalise, uh, we have shared the Haudenosaunee Address um, and talked about this not in terms of prayer, but as, as a way of coming together and remembering um, to share our allegiance of gratitude to all these gifts that we receive every day and to be thinking about what it would a classroom look like. So what does it look like for the children, the Haudenosaunee children who show up to their tribal school every day and on the intercom, um, they share this, this allegiance to gratitude and it starts their day together with their teachers and their administrators um, and with one another. And what kind of frame of mind that brings us to when we live in a gift culture and a gift economy. Um, and so I want to, I want to take us uh, one step further. If you thought we were stepping farther and farther away from multicultural education, um, we're not. We're actually stepping closer and closer to it in a really broad sense. And so I want to share a little bit of the teachings of Robin Kimmerer with you because I'm a huge, a huge fan. A huge fan, a huge hand. That's, that is, that's a new one. Um, it's super awesome. That just means super, super awesome. So we're going we're gonna to be watching a segment. I'd love to show the whole thing, but then it, this would be Robin Kimmerer's presentation. And, and so and actually that would be pretty amazing. Put that on your list of things to do is, and, and make sure I get to come. Um, so I'm going to share with you a bit of her TED Talk where she talks about the honorable harvest. And I'm going to ask you ahead of time to be thinking about, now why in the world is Kristen talking to us about the Thanksgiving address and the honorable harvest? And what does that have to do with education? Oops. This is where I need Tanya. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Greetings. My name is Light Shining Through Sky Woman. I'm of the Potawatomi Nation, member of the Eagle Clan, and the Bear. My ancestors are Anishinaabe, the original people, and Zaganosh, the newcomers. I'm a mother, a daughter, a sister, an auntie. Who could want anything more? But I have a confession to make. I wish that I could photosynthesize. <laughs> to make food out of light and water, to make medicines and give them away for free, to do the work of the world and for the world while standing silently in the sun. But I can't. I'm not an autotroph, a producer, but a heterotroph. I'm an animal. I'm destined by my biology to be a consumer. I must take from the world in order to live. But if I could photosynthesize, I would make berries. <laughs> in the Potawatomi language, we call these beautiful berries odemen, the heartberry. We acknowledge them as the leaders of the berry people, for they're the first to give us their fruits in the summer. In the language I was born to, we call them strawberries. And in the language I've learned as a scientist, we call them by the Latin binomial Frageria virginiana. And in all three languages, they are so sweet. I'm a scientist, a plant ecologist, and also a student, just a beginner, of our traditional teachings. My understanding of the world lies at the intersection of two great ways of knowing, between science and indigenous knowledge. And in scientific ways of thinking, these berries are the reproductive structures of a distinct species, a vital component of the food web. In indigenous ways of thinking, we recognize them as the berry people, who are persons, non-human persons, with their own intrinsic roles in the democracy of species. These are sovereign beings with their own intelligences, their own wisdom, their own responsibilities. Berries, as persons, in some nations, as you know, the rights of all species are enshrined in the Constitution because they are people. In US law, corporations are granted the status of people, while berries are without any right at all. <laughs> I ask you, what corporation gives you wild strawberries on a summer morning? By any measure, when you put one in your mouth, you know that wild strawberries are a gift, all wrapped in red and green. The natural world is a source of gifts, not commodities, but gifts. Berries are given to us by the plants themselves. In fact, in our language, the Potawatomi word for berry, min, is very closely related to our word for giving gifts, ninidawag, giving a gift is to be as a berry. How we think about our relationship to the living world matters deeply. It is our moral imagination that will shape our futures as much as any technology or policy. When something is understood as a gift instead of a commodity, a door opens. An opening to the potential for reciprocity. And much of mainstream culture has chosen to see the earth as property. But we, we could choose differently. We, you and I together, we could choose to live in a world made of gifts. And as human people, we are showered daily with gifts from Shak Makwe, Mother Earth. And the question we face as non-photosynthetic, lamentably, beings is how do we respond to the gifts of the Earth? How can we be ecological consumers as we must in a way that honors those gifts? We have only to look around us at the wounds we have inflicted on the earth to know that we don't yet have that answer. And where will we find a teacher for this most pressing question of our time when our actions have brought creation to the brink of a massive wave of extinction when we stand at the edge of a climate precipice? And in my culture, plants are known not only as people, but as our teachers, our oldest teachers, 
After all, they've been here far longer than we have. They know how to fulfill their responsibilities. While we human people are still trying to figure it out, they know how to build soil, recycle water, create homes for endless other beings. They give us the very air we breathe. They know how to make berries out of light. We might do well to listen. And if berries are our teachers, what are they telling us? In our ceremonies, we honor the berries by passing them in a bowl for everybody in the circle to share. And they remind us of the teachings known as the one bowl, one spoon, that the earth is as one bowl, filled with everything that we need, a bowl with finite capacity. When it's empty, it's empty. And there's just one spoon, the same one for all of us, for humans and for the more than humans alike. There cannot be a teaspoon for some people and a power shovel for others. So say the berries. Indigenous science and philosophy is a rich source of wisdom for the challenges we face in the future. And I've had the gift of wonderful teachers who have shared with me. And it's now my responsibility to share with you. Let's suppose that you're writing a really important email to a colleague. So thank you, and thank you for the, we had a little intermission there, did a little couple dance moves. Um, uh, the corporate world snuck into Robin Kimmerer. Uh, but what I'd like you to do for just a moment is to talk to the person sitting next to you about um, where do you think um, an honorable, well, and let me move this over here to the honorable harvest. So Robin continues to talk about um, what does it mean to harvest honorably. So how do we interact with our um, more than human um, community members? And how do we, we gather resources? And so she talks about um, know the ways of the ones who take care of you so that you may take care of them. So when she goes out to gather strawberries, she introduces herself. Um, so she asks that we be accountable as the one who comes asking for life. Um, and then we need to ask permission before taking and abide by the answers. And I'm going to come back to this um, again later this evening in, in our presentation together about what that looks like in practice. Um, never take the first. Never take the last. Because you don't know if the first one that you see is the only one that there is. Um, take only what you need. Take only that which is given. Never take more than half. Leave some for others. Harvest in a way that minimizes harm. She talks about rather than using a shovel, can you use a digging stick? Um, use it respectfully. Never waste what you've taken. And always share. Give thanks for what you have been given. And again, she talks about um, take what is given. So she, an example of that would be um, if we remove a mountaintop for coal, we are, um, we're not taking something that's been given to us. Um, we're um, destroying something in order to get something that we desire. Uh, if we drill for oil um, in the tar sands, then we are not taking something that's been given to us. We are extracting that. Um, but she says a, an example of taking what's given is when Francisco and I were flying in our boutique uh, airplane and survived, um, I was happy that, that one of my last visions on Earth might have been the, wind, the, the windmills, the, the, the wind, um, help me here, turbines. turbines, thank you. And that they, that that's, wind is given to us freely, as is the, the surf of the ocean. Um, as is the sunlight every single day. And I'm reminded by one of my dear um, teachers and friends, um, Leslie Harper, who was the originator of the language, the Miyagani Language Immersion School in Leech Lake, Minnesota, Minnesota. She reminds me that she said, there are grandmothers who wake up every morning at dawn 
and pray the sun to rise for us. And thank goodness they do that every day. We don't know who they are. They're doing it for all of us. They don't even know who we are. Um, but we can be grateful for them for doing that. So again, um, give thanks for what you have been given. Um, give a gift of, in reciprocity for what you have taken. And sustain the ones who sustain you, and the earth will last forever. So I'd like you to just take a moment um, and think about, I'll put those back, um, think about the honorable harvest and how might that have something to do with educating our youth um, or working together as colleagues, um, as faculty members and staff. So just take a couple minutes, just a brief couple minutes. ask you to come back to me and we're going to talk again in a, in a couple minutes so if you could wrap up your last thoughts I love this. My, if, are, are any of you familiar with In the Actors Studio um, with James Lipton? And he says, like, you know, what's your favorite swear word? He asks these famous people, you know, all these great questions. And, and one of them is, and I'm not going to tell you what my favorite swear word is because I'm, I'm on camera. Um, <laughs> and although I'm a tenured professor now and I can swear, um, I'm being reminded that part of our presentation today, tonight, is about um, carrying hope. So I need to be respectful for those that I'm um, carrying some hope for. Um, but uh, in, in that, one of my favorite sounds is, if James Lipton asked me, I'd, it would be that sound, is people having great conversations with each other in the classroom or in spaces where we're developing our consciousness. So thank you for that. So we're going to come back to this conversation shortly. Um, but I wanted to bring in the honorable landscape of multicultural education. And so when, when I shared at the beginning that, you know, where have we come in a year? Well, I'd have to say that the last 24 years of my career have been really focusing on multicultural education. Um, with a, a deep lens on indigenous education, but I've spent about 20 years of my career focusing on multicultural education and having the privilege of studying um, with Sonia Nieto, which I talked about last 
um, time I was here of having her mentorship. And so I really honor her definition, which really looks at multicultural education as a process of comprehensive school reform um, and basic education for all students. So you don't see the tacos on Tuesday, fried bread on Friday in this definition. Not against dancing and singing and eating my way for sure um, through culture, but if that's the only thing that we have, it's, it's not enough. Um, so it has to also challenge and reject racism and other forms of discrimination in schools and society and accepts this pluralistic um, uh, view of students, communities, um, and that teachers reflect that as well. Multicultural education permeates the school's curriculum, so it's throughout everything we do, our instructional strategies, as well as our interactions among each other, um, our students and our families. And the very ways schools conceptualize the nature of teaching and learning. So that's heavy, that's, that's huge. And, and that's what we're trying to do. And she has, um, as, as being a mentor of mine, um, I asked her often, where does decolonization fit into um, an idea of multicultural education? And Sonia, who has these beautiful seven characteristics of multicultural education, anti-racist, it's basic, it's for all students, it's pervasive, it's education for social justice, it's a process, um, it's critical pedagogy. So Sonia has said to me many times, multicultural education is not defined by these characteristics. It can be, um, it could have a hundred characteristics. So she, she has been very um, open and, um, and inviting of multiple ways of knowing and being in multicultural education. But I have to say that it wasn't until I read Francisco's piece on um, framing multicultural education as a human right that I really got to see and, and see in writing where um, decolonization or countering colonization and challenging hegemony were explicit in, in a way of looking at multicultural education. And so we actually use both Sonia Nieto's book in our 310 course as well as um, Francisco's article because the, those, we do, I know, and it's not just because you're my dean. No, nope, that's not it, not at all, nope. Um, see, there's, I have nothing to gain from this at this point, um, but because it really is um, an enormous contribution to the field of multicultural education, to look at multicultural education, not just as, um, and, and let, me, let me backtrack a little bit. Sonia, when she talks about multicultural education, she never says critical multicultural education or a new multicultural education because she says the original definition holds social justice, um, equity, um, anti-discriminatory, it holds everything that it needs to in the original definition. How it gets appropriated is different. It was never envisioned to be uh, a celebration of diversity that is shallow without the critical lens. It's always been critical. Um, but how time has shifted that in the ways that people can actually see themselves including it um, has shifted. So um, that's where you'll see the cross out of the new. So I'll, I honor my beloved mentor um, that this is not a new multicultural education, but it's feeling different. It's starting to feel very different to me this year, particularly this year. So going back to Francisco's presentation um, last April, he talked about the changing demographics and closing the opportunity gap or the education debt, um, talked about how we need to develop these cross-cultural competencies so that we can engage with each other in, in good ways. And countering colonization. So when he talks about this, and I have the quote from here, the ide ideology of colonization includes um, the proposition that Western Europe is the, is the, for, the front of the highest form of civilization. And it did so unaided by any other regions or nations of the great world, so we, of, the, of the world. So we, colonization has many definitions and one of the ways that we look at it is that it holds a lot of Western framed ideology. Um, but it's not only that, and I wanna share an, an addition, um, Sandy Grande, who I also um, am a super, what did I call it? A, a, 
a, a, a Hun fan, no, whatever, a huge fan, um, and I'll, I'll figure out my, my other, uh, the way I say that in a more ex expressive way shortly. I can't do it when I want to do it, I can only do it when I don't. Um, but Sandy Grande um, writes that um, while it falls outside the bounds of the work that she's doing to discuss the his historic continuities of settler colonialism, suffice it to say um, that what began as a political project contingent upon the elimination of indigenous peoples in, the, in order to appropriate indigenous land has persisted through the forces of accumulation by dispossession or what Wolf has termed as the logic of elimination. So colonization at its forefront was to displace, eliminate people and acquire their lands and resources. And that's still happening today. Um, and of course, Sandy, similar to Sonia, does not believe in using neocolonialism as if it's something new because it's the same old colonialism that it's always been. So two of my mentors are sharing that with me. Uh, let's go back to when Francisco talks about um, multicultural edu education as a human right, um, that um, what it looks like. And um, cultural diversity is um, cultural democratic, which I love this. In fact, Francisco, you'll appreciate that our students really love this too, because it helps get at um, agency and democratic participation, that we are all citizens. We are all engaged citizens. Um, and giving that explicit human rights education. Under the sociocultural, we have a broader vision of reality. We learn about and from each other. So it is reciprocal, again, reciprocity. Um, and there's freedom, the idea of freedom from discrimination. Um, and then it also is, and so our students look at it from, you know, like the circle. So the cultural democratic, the sociocultural, and then the, the psychocultural which is the epistemological justice, which for me is one of my absolute favorites because I do not see that in many discussions around multicultural education, which means that we do actually honor that there are multiple ways of knowing and being in the world. And if we honor that there are multiple ways of knowing and being in the world, then in this it says, then we see oneself in the curriculum. So we don't just provide a one way of understanding and, and um, a film that I love to show that I, I'll um, share the link with you is called Grandfather, How Do I Learn? And it's indigenous uh, scientists and Western scientists coming together to try to figure out how do we do this together? And if we, and, and um, Marie Batiste, who's amazing, a native scholar, she talks about when we have the ability to think bicognitively, we are truly brilliant if we can think in indigenous ways of knowing as an indigenous people and understand Western ways of knowing and being, then we are truly capable of coming up with um, solutions to some of our most profound problems. And I'll say that in addition to an allegiance to gratitude. So when Francisco um, concluded last year, he shared with us that um, some recommendations that we need to learn about others. We need to learn with and from others. We need to learn about human rights education. We need to take an anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-homophobic stance at the individual, institutional, and ideological levels. And then two that I highlighted, because I feel very deeply connected to them this year, is um, act at the institutional level to forge more inclusive policies and practices. How do we make it possible for our great teachers to do great work? How do we make it possible for institutions to do the work that they need to do? And then finally, um, building alliances and connecting with others. Okay, so I asked you before. Um, I said we're gonna be as a berry. So we're gonna come back to your discussions with each other. Um, so what can we learn from the more than human people? We know the definition of multicultural education. We've included multicultural education as a human right. What would multicultural education as a more than human right look like as well? So as you talk again with each other, um, Robin Kimmerer talks about the honorable harvest asks us to give back in reciprocity um, for what we have been given. We have been given so many amazing gifts every single day. Um, the ability to breathe, that's pretty awesome. 
Um, reciprocity helps us resolve the moral tension of taking a life by giving in return something of value that sustains the ones who sustain us. One of our responsibilities as human people is to find ways to enter into reciprocity with the more than human world. We can do it through gratitude, through ceremony, through land stewardship, science, and everyday acts of practical reverence, and I added in and multicultural education. So where do you see connections? So again, after hearing, getting the refresher of Francisco's great work from last year, come back to your conversations. And again, how can we be as a berry? And what can we learn from the more than human people in multicultural education? I'm going to ask that you come back. I know that's not enough time. There's so much more to say. But I'm curious what you all were talking about. What were some, what were ways that you see connections? How were your conversations about being as a berry? Did you figure out how to photosynthesize? I would love that too. You know, pretty amazing, incredible. So what were some things that you came up with? What were some thoughts? I heard you talking. You know there was stuff going on there. Where could you see the honorable harvest in our classrooms? I'm sorry, we were, just, we were just wrapping up the answer to that question. Oh. Um, and we were talking about 
um, the issue of time and how we use time in the classroom and um, that so often we feel driven by whatever outcomes we have planned for the day, whatever we're trying to get the students to demonstrate and figure out, that sometimes we forget that we need to take the time as human beings to be together in a classroom and, um, and, to, and, to, add, and to invite students to be there as human beings and to bring what they have as human beings into that space um, and to shift the, shift the time to make space for that. excited you said that because it just helps what's coming next it's like thank you but that's not the point that's not the purpose just exciting I one of my takeaways here was um, for us to be willing more regularly to acknowledge uh, where we are ignorant where we don't even know what we don't know in acknowledging perspectives or possible answers um, to questions where we might walk into the room with our expertise, but there are so many other options out there that we don't acknowledge. Thank you. So we were talking about the reciprocity piece and one of the things that it makes me think about is the reciprocity of relationships with our students and so we we know that building really good relationships with students helps in our teaching and so if we want to know if we want to build those relationships we have to know our students but we also have to give to them and help them to know us as well to really build a solid foundation in that relationship Absolutely. Oh, you all are just geniuses and brilliant. This is wonderful. Well, I'm going to go ahead because of time, um, share with you, uh, and I'm so glad to hear where you all are at because it's reaffirming um, to the work that we've been doing because we're all in those same spaces. How do we, um, how do we engage with the honorable harvest as a true real experience in, in really connecting to the um, more than human rights in multicultural education, as well as the honorable harvest of how do we engage with our young people and families and communities. Um, and also how do we you know, let go of some of our time parameters and what we think needs to happen within the, um, uh, and, and I have a quote in, in um, further down about how we become very, um, uh, we get inducted into this way that we think things have to be and with certain standards and we often lose some of the, the bigger picture of what we're really trying to do for our community. So I really appreciate looking at time. And so I want to share some emerging, an emerging journey for a not new multicultural education through these relationships and through restoration and reciprocity. So. Um, Last year at this time, I was working with a group of people to, um, from the University of Washington, including Megan Bang and Elizabeth West and Don Stevens, who are all Native scholars, um, and my colleague Annalise and our, our buddy in history, Chris Friday. Um, we, and we were working with the Office of uh, the Native Education in Washington State to um, get this grant to develop our um, since time immemorial curriculum from uh, how do we get our classroom teachers, our school districts to embody this curriculum, which is now a law, and then um, how do we support communities that are developing their own tribal-based, tribal-specific curriculum? Well, little did I know that things would change for me um, significantly with that process. Now, in the meantime, we're all living in the same complex world um, where um, our undocumented students are experiencing um, deep heartbreak and fear. And we're also living in a world, um, at least on our campus, where we had a lot of racial um, strife and incidents. And how do we really do anti-racist education? Um, how do we develop our consciousness with, with, with one another? 
So there was a lot going on, and, and I'm the, um, one of the faculty advisors for the Native American Student Union. And around this time last year, our Native American Student Union um, shared their list of urgent needs about what they need from their campus that they haven't received um, since the campus began, and really urging the administration to shift. So there was a lot going on. And, um, and during that time, I got to know Dr. Megan Bang at the University of Washington, who is a Native scholar, very amazing, and does water, land, place, and space work from an indigenous perspective. So she's a science teacher. She comes from a science teacher background. And so working with her really pushed my thinking on what does it look like for us and I'm such a humanist. I am all about people and community. And to um, be hearing my elders talking about our, um, our connection to the more than human people um, throughout time, but I wasn't really, there's, you know, when, you're, when you see the urgency within your students and your community members, it's really hard to see the urgency of our planet or so hard to see the urgency that's going on in our backyard. Um, or in our lack of medicines, um, or our ceremonies, and how our connection with the more human people helps us to become more human ourselves. So um, I really look to, that's when I also found um, Robin, who's amazing, and also uh, continuing to develop my um, deep relationship with the work of Sandy Grande. And she's actually an extraordinary person too. And I, I'm reminded when she came to campus, um, at, to Western, she talked about um, the environmental challenges that we face as indigenous people and, um, and choices. And she got a question from the audience about, well, I see native people do some really horrible things. And I, I really, I've been thinking a lot about her response and her response was, when all of your choices are poor choices, what choice do you have? And so that, I've been thinking about that quite a bit. So she came out with a piece that Francisco um, shared with me, which was called Save Slash See the Forest and Think Like a Mountain, which is based on a piece written by, um, uh, is it Leopold Aldo? Are people familiar with his work? Um, I'm not an environmentalist, um, so environmental justice is definitely a part of who I am, but it hasn't been my, my education background. So I'm coming to this and I, I appreciate the humility as I'm learning um, with these beautiful scholars and also kind of coming back to my own indigeneity through the more than human people. But she talks about, this piece is about deforestation and, uh, and the impact on wolves. And it's a very beautiful piece. And so she's working with his work on um, She's not saying we don't need to save the forest, we need to see the forest and think like a mountain. And she again talks about um, um, colonization, settler colonialism. So I'm gonna share with you, she talks about um, settler colonialism as being educational deforestation. So again, using our environmental justice to be thinking about our education system. And she goes on to say that that educational deforestation is an agenda fueled by um, the remove to replace logic of settler colonialism, under which schools have experienced clear cutting of curricula, slashing and burning of budgets, and an exploitation of local human and material re resources for private gain. But she doesn't leave us hanging in education there. Um, she's saying that seeing, this act of seeing, seeing the forest, seeing, is an act of radical love um, predicated on close examination, openness to experience, empathy, and care. And I think all of us as multicultural educators, that's like, yes, we are so there. That just speaks to us. And forests like classrooms are life-giving only insofar as the complex network of systems and relations that sustain them are cultivated and appreciated. So we need to examine those networks of systems, the time. Um, so she says, my hope for teachers is that we organize instead a mass movement of restoration. 
And restoration was a really interesting word for me because, and I was sharing with Francisco the other day, like, what are we restoring? Because in education, for many of us, um, the system was never set up for us. So we can't really restore that system. So what are we restoring? And I think what we're restoring is um, how do we learn? Um, the ways that we learn um, and our teaching. And so in conclusion, she talks about um, resist knowledge as production and see knowledge as a relationship to place, to history, to self, to other, to community, and to, a higher, to higher senses of being, in other words, to mountains. So I love that you'll see that a lot of this is reflected in Sonia Nieto's definition and in Francisco's definition and in the work of um, Robin Kimmerer. So I'll come back to Robin, but I wanna share with you, okay, so that's all nice and you know, great, but what does it look like in practice? So in the meantime, here I am living in Bellingham, Washington, and I live in a house that has a peach tree. Okay, um, how on the West Coast there's a peach tree in my yard? I have no idea, but I have learned quite a bit about peach trees recently, and that there's only one kind of peach tree that actually gro grows on the West Side, and luckily we've got it. So we're kind of a hot commodity in Bellingham. Um, <laughs> and so I, I, I brought some peach for you, but you have to come to the presentation tomorrow to have some peach jam. So um, I, I want to introduce you to Dr. Annalise, my colleague. And over here, this is Elaine Mahari, who's a dear staff and colleague and friend and former student of mine, um, and Dr. Um, Vero Velez. And I also have grapes. So for years, the grapes came at the beginning of the quarter. And boy, that is not a good time for grapes at all, and so many years I would just cut the grapes down, put them in the box, and take them to the food bank, and always feeling bad that I, I was not honoring the grapes. In the meantime, um, my colleagues and I, um, as women of color working in the academy, were struggling. Like, how do we, how do we maintain our own well-being and healing? How do we support each other? Um, and then how do I deal with these grapes, right? So we decided that we were gonna take back some of these traditional women's um, things, right? And so this story um, begins in my kitchen. So it was a hot day in August and September um, and we were doing our jamming work. So we started talking about jamming as a metaphor. And, and so I crossed out, because actually it wasn't a metaphor. We were actually making jam. <laughs> and so it's not a metaphor, but in the other sense, it was a metaphor. So here we are as colleagues, wanting to spend time with each other, and also um, understanding the natural environment that we were working with, and learning that it, uh, an, a scholar I, I really appreciate said, um, as in terms of time, you know, gestation, it takes nine months. You, you don't get to choose, uh, you know, you don't get to say, I'm not having my baby today. Um, you know, and nature is the same way. I didn't get to say, grapes, please wait till the next weekend after I get my syllabus done and, and all the meetings are over. It doesn't work like that. And actually, our work doesn't work like that either. When our students come to us and they're in crisis, do we finish our paperwork or do we tend to our students? Um, when everything falls apart sociopolitically, um, where do we stand with one another and our students um, and our paperwork? So, and then so how, where do we lean? How do we support each other? So we decided to look at, um, so we started talking with each other about our grandmothers. So Anna is Odawa um, for the, from the Little Traverse Band um, in Michigan. And uh, Dr. Um, Velez is Chicanex. And so we all come to this work together um, from places of indigenous ancestry. So we started wrestling with making jam. What does that mean? So we have to cultivate. We, so somebody had to take care of the peach tree and the grapes. Um, and thank goodness for me, I have a loving family who is very supportive of helping me with all the yard work. Um, and then we have to harvest. So you have to have just the right time to harvest too. You don't want to har harvest too early and then you definitely need support. We were realizing when we decided to jam, I um, grew up with jamming but I didn't actually jam as an adult. 
So I've never canned, and so this was new for me. And actually it was new for both my colleagues and several other people that we pulled into the process. So we had to harvest. Also when you're doing canning or jamming, you have to organize your tools, right? You can't just say, I'm gonna jam, I'm gonna can. And then wait, where's the jars? And where's the pot? And where's the, wait, I have to boil that? What do I boil that in? And my fingers are gonna burn if I touch this really hot glass. So we have to get all of our tools together and prepare. And what we learned is we were talking about our grandmothers doing this. And my grandmother, um, my grandmother was born on Birch Creek in Browning, Montana on the Blackfeet Reservation and lived in a house without running water and with a pot-bellied stove. And I imagined my grandmother learning how to can in August um, in a hot kitchen in a stucco house with dirt floors. And um, there's no way she could have done that by herself. There was a whole community that helped in the canning process. Um, and so we had to collaborate. And of course there is a process and of course you have to preserve it or I wouldn't be able to share this jam with you on this beautiful April day, months after the peaches were ripe. And of course the culture of reciprocity or the allegiance to gratitude is you have to share. So there's no way I could come and do this presentation and not bring you jam, I'd be in such, such trouble. So um, I wanna share with you a little bit about um, our process. So in terms of the cultivation, I wanna share that um, we thought of cultivation as very generational. The process begins long before jamming. Um, we made our commitment to each other that we would prioritize the process to reimagine and sustain our work together. You have to believe that the jam that will come much later on is necessary for nourishment in the future. We are not our grandmothers, but trying to do the work in a good way. The cultivation of our critical consciousness was made possible by our experience in the academy and considering the difference between capitalism and gift-giving societies as well. So in terms of the harvest for us, it was about spiritual, spirituality and ecology, um, and they're profound in the harvest for us. And it's nothing new, um, but we were engaging in a meaningful process that builds on our wisdom and understanding together. So when we were thinking about this in terms of healing or collaboration, we were looking at, um, you know, who are the folks on our jamming team? Who are our critical friends? Who are the folks that we can connect with? Um, and what is it that we need to harvest to reach our community goals? Um, um, the work can't be done alone, and it's also time sensitive. So in terms of organizing too, I love this picture. I wish it was a little bit bigger. Um, Anna holding the grapes. Um, what tools do we already have to accomplish our community goals? There's lots of things we already have. Um, and then what might we need and, and how do we do this together? Then we start talking about um, preparing in collaboration. Now, making grape jam is a little bit different than making peach jam as well. Um, grape jam, uh, and not grape jelly, but grape jam is a little bit time intensive because you have to, now I understand when they say, peel me a grape. It's like, <laughs> if you're peeling a lot of grapes, um, it has a, yeah, I would much rather have someone peel me a grape for sure. So the preparation is something else. Um, and so who is doing what? Who's peeling the grapes? You know, who's mashing the grapes? Who's sieving the grapes? Um, you know, what skill sets do we have? Um, and how can we make sure everyone's okay in the process of doing this? And always remember that how we enter that space matters. And what we mean by that is that for Anna and I, our teachings were always that you can't cook dinner angry I don't know if you have similar philosophies in your families, because what happens if you cook angry? All that bad food to everybody. That's right. Love and That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. My first husband got sick all the time, <laughs> and I don't know why. Nobody else got sick when I was cooking. Anyway, side note. Um, so always remember how we enter a space matters. So. Um, how we come into not just the jamming as a non-metaphorical space, but also in our jamming space, how do we come, how we come to that matters. And also check the conditions. Jamming is hot work. Um, and so we have to check in with each other. Like who's over the stove? Do we need to give them a break from stirring? 
in August, um, even though it's Bellingham. So we have to watch out for each other. And so we each have our roles, and we each lean on each other, and we pay attention to our collective and personal needs. So in terms of preparing and collaboration, um, collaboration for us, again, was generational. We thought about our grandmothers, and we're actually working on writing about this together. And um, when we, um, we started to wrestle with um, some of our Chicana feminists who were talking about when did the act of jamming lose its sacredness? When did we stop, when did we start calling it or thinking about this as women's work or it's not that important? And for us, we were saying, um, what we brought to a relationship um, that was challenging these notions of patriarchy as if jamming wasn't essential. Jamming's essential. Um, it's preserving food so that we can sustain ourselves through the winter time for our families, our children, our, our grandparents, our community members. And so we began to challenge some of these, um, what was considered women work, women's work, um, and then it helped us to rethink that in terms of the academy as well. And um, my beautiful sister, Anna, who's Anishinaabe, said that this is the seventh fire, to reclaim and acknowledge that our work is sacred, the work we do is sacred, um, that, um, and an insistence that our lives and our knowledge matters. The sacrifice and efforts that have been made by those who came before is honored and recognized in that gratitude. So of course, then comes the sharing, the best part. So after, um, I could share more about the process and preserving. Uh, let me just let me just touch base on that really quickly, um, in terms of the the process was also around intimacy, and um, the in intimacy of knowing the land. So for us, actual jamming was getting to understand the grapes in a different way, and getting to understand how the the peaches how how we could support the peaches better. But there was also an intimacy in working the land and loving each other, which became powerful. So there was reasons that our grandmothers got together in the kitchen and did this together. Not just because you know it helped each other, but we developed relationships with, another, with one another. We developed an intimacy, and it was also an intimacy with the more than human people. So finding pleasure in the process and the work. So by finding pleasure in doing this hard labor of jamming, there was a lot of laughter. Um, it changed in perception of the process. What am I going to do with all these grapes as like a burden to viewing the grapes as a gift with love as we harvested the grapes and canned them together? The relational and, and mutual nature of the harvest, as, as um, Kimmermer talks about, the sweet grass doesn't grow if it's not harvested. So the grapes you know, will come back to us tenfold because we understand and honor the gift. And then preserving it is how do we make sense of and claim our identities, preserving ourselves by making clear where we stand and with whom we stand. So we made a commitment to each other during that jamming time, and that was in, the, in late summer and early fall, that we would take this jamming experience into us, into our academic lives. And we have. So we've been jamming ever since, metaphorically. We haven't been, we've been talking about, we, we kind of missed the tomatoes. Uh, we, we ate the apples. We didn't actually make apple butter. Um, but we also have been sharing the jam, literally. And um, we've been sharing the jam with each other. So in rough times, we nourish each other. We're there for one another. So what happens after the harvest? And I'm going to do this very quickly because I have about five minutes. Okay. Um, so after the harvest time, it's, um, it's coming on winter. We're done harvesting. We've gathered our goods. We're, we're hands. We're in the dirt. And we're now reaping the rewards of the harvest. And so this comes to the story work. So the grant that we applied for last um, time we were here we, we got, which was pretty exciting, um, a $400,000 grant, and getting to work with these incredible indigenous women. 
And, and so I, I mentioned Dr. Megan Bang, and I, and I want to mention her again, and, and I would encourage you to um, read her work. Um, oh, there's so much I want to share with you about Joanne Archibald as well, but we'll come back to that. We can talk about that tonight. But Megan Bang is um, land, water, place, and space. So again, how do we bring in the more than human people into um, a more than human people rights education as multicultural education as a human right? And so one of the ways to do that for Megan is getting to know place. So she does this with children and she also does this at the University of Washington. And so for her, key objectives for classroom teachers as well as the work that we do with one another is to one, um, so let me just briefly share with you. We started at the Longhouse at the University of Washington, and we learned about the Native folks that were in that particular place, and from the people. And then we went outside the Longhouse, and that's where um, around the Longhouse they planted traditional plants to that area. They planted them in a way that they were supportive of one another. Um, and she asked us to pay attention to what was going on around us. And then we started walking away from the garden we started walking on to the UW's campus. And then she started to tell us about, um, then we started to see the, the landscape change and the buildings. And in Red Square, um, that was developed um, during the time of the eugenics movement, it was all a reflection of the time. And the manicured lawns were about order and keeping things in order. So we saw this movement and understanding the place that we were on in that way shifted our consciousness about where we were. And so that's what Megan does with kids. She helps them do mapping. Um, and so we've been able to work with different school districts, and, and one in particular working with the Spokane School District that has 30,000 students and working with their tribal liaisons and looking at mapping and they're developing plateau curriculum, which is really awesome. But I wanna share with you some of the key objectives that Megan talks about when doing this work. And one, is that history lives in the places that we are. It shapes how the flows of everyday life happen in the present. Also, the construction of people's relationship to land is always present, implicitly and explicitly. In the US, negating indigenous relations to place and establishing settler relations, and this is what I was talking about, then becomes routine. Um, though maybe not always intentional or conscious. So we have to work to interrupt those routines. Land-based change is not just about people. Land-based education seeks to understand the changes to land and all life connected to it. And then finally, relearning to read land means grappling with issues of power and inequity at the same time we see and appreciate strengths. So I wanted to share with you just quickly that the work continued, the story work, which, um, Joanne Archibald talks about as um, story work is a type of sharing and a form of storying that shares personal life experiences and it's done with compa a compassionate mind and love for others. And all, many of us have communities where storying or story work is really important. So this year I had the opportunity to start to put that into practice. So if I'm gonna be asking um, teachers to be doing this, I better be doing this too. So we went out Thule gathering um, at Benjamin Lake um, with the Spokane um, uh, teachers and, um, and tribal members. And also we did some place-based work with Spokane School District with the indigenous folks of that area around Spokane Falls and learned about that. Um, and one of the biggest aha moments for me is my opportunity to go with one of my tribal elders and uh, a Pyramid Lake um, Paiute, uh, wonderful person um, to go to Stone Mother um, at Pyramid Lake. And this is, a, it's really hard to see this, um, and I'll share the link with you, but it's this incredible rock formation that has this beautiful story. And maybe later this evening I can share that story with you. It's a great link um, to, to, to share a little bit more about how our stories of place um, teach us about how to be in that place and also teach us about how to be with each other. And also give us some tools on how to restore those places as well. So um, finally, um, as we come to 
where we are again now. Um, coming back to the grant, coming back to this idea of our deep connections and our, our um, commitments to one another as colleagues, critical friends. Um, and I want to go back to Francisco's definition of, of um, multicultural education as a human right and about having leaders who are willing to see the importance of the work that we do that's a connection to people and place. And so Francisco, um, a year, so if I would go back another year, Francisco created an opportunity for me um, to have a special assignment to look at how we would address the laws in Washington State, and I talked about this last year, um, to incorporate um, our K-12 since time memorial tribal sovereignty curriculum. And where we've been able to go with that is, is pretty incredible, and the possibilities. So if we don't make those deeper connections to, so this work, I feel couldn't have happened if we weren't on a journey of restoration, reciprocity, responsibility, renewal, and gratitude with one another. Um, and so what we've been able to do with Francisco's mentorship is to organize a summit for all the deans of colleges of education in the state of Washington, bring them all together, and talk with them about how are we how are we addressing the mandate to make sure that all teachers understand tribal sovereignty and are able to teach that with young children? And then we were able to do that on a more um, local level with the eight different school districts that we're working with in the state of Washington. And not only that, we were able to bring that back into our college and say, how do we do that here? If we can do it with, our, with people in the school districts, if we can have these conversations with the deans of colleges of education, then how do we actually implement that in our own college? So that's where we are now, is in the implementation process. And so since I was here last year, my goodness, have I learned a lot. And, um, and I'm continuing to be in that process of learning. And, um, and I'd like to just conclude by, again, um, thanking you all for the opportunity to, to have time to reflect on this year and to reflect on the presentation that my wonderful colleague and leader and friend um, shared with us last year. And, um, and in the process too, created some really deep relationships with students. And I'll be talking this evening about, um, about the student aspect of um, the growth and this kind of a process of renewal, relationships, restoration, responsibility, and reciprocity. And then um, just in conclusion, um, I want to just remind you that this work is messy. Um, you're gonna have to get your hands dirty, especially if you're, if you're, you're digging in the dirt. I'm talking farm hands. Um, and you know, getting our hands messy in, in the challenges. But when we look at the gifts and we see and we come from an allegiance of gratitude, it gives us the hope that we um, need to continue to do the messy work. And knowing that we have those that are doing this work with us makes all the difference. So um, uh, it's um, remembering for us to honor those that walk alongside of us and I want to thank you all for allowing me to lock, walk alongside of you last year and to do that again this time. And, um, and I'm really hoping that you'll all have an opportunity to share some of the gift of a little bit of sunshine, a little bit of rare sunshine of peach yam. I wish I could have bring, brought you the grape jelly, but that went fast. <laughs> Let me tell you that I will, next time I will bring grape jelly. Um, but again, thank you for the opportunity to share today, and um, I really appreciate this time, and thank you, Tanya.